I'd like to invite you to my new podcast, Move Your Mind, where we have real conversations with real people and give real advice. I'm super excited for this next episode of Move Your Mind. Greg Leganis is considered the greatest diver in history, having won four Olympic gold medals in the three metre and 10 metre diving events. He's also the first man in Olympic history to sweep the diving events in consecutive Olympic games. At the Seoul 1988 games, he suffered a concussion during the preliminary rounds of the three metre event, and it almost put an end to his medal hopes. He competed despite the injury, claiming two gold medals. After his competitive diving career, Leganis became an LGBTQ activist and has worked frequently with the human rights campaign to defend the civil liberties of the LGBTQ community and those diagnosed with HIV. I met Greg about eight years ago on a reality show called Celebrity Splash. He was a judge, I was a competitor, probably one of the worst divers in the history of that very short-lived show, but I got to meet him. He's an amazing guy someone I'm lucky enough to call a friend now. And one of the things I love most about him is that he's just such a genuine person. He's the epitome of showing vulnerability and he's dedicated his life to helping others. I just can't wait for you guys to hear this episode. Greg, thank you so much for coming on my podcast. I've, I think this is the first time I've spoken to you in about eight years. I met you <laughs> in Australia under uh, unusual circumstances. So it's uh, so great to reconnect with you. And I just want to say, I know how busy you are. I know how much you get approached to do these kind of things. So I, I, I genuinely feel very honored to have you come on my podcast and have sure. this conversation with me. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah cause you were on, uh, I was judging the celebrity splash in Australia and, uh, and you're one of the contestants, which was like, so cool. We, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. I was probably, uh, I mean, that show only went for one season. And I think in that one season, I, I did one of the worst jobs of diving. I, I, I did attempt your famous dive and basically turned it into what we call in Australia, a, a belly worker. So fell on yeah. my stomach from the um, 10 meter platform, but I gave it a go. <laughs> you gave it a go. That's yeah. what's important. You try things. You try and see, yeah, see, see how far you can go, right? Exactly. That's that's all you can do. Uh, <laughs> so before before we get in um, into it, we normally ask the guests, are you able to just give a, a background on yourself uh, and how you came to where you are today? Uh, background on myself? Well, uh, shoot, where do you start? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to cover. I mean, it, it, probably a, a bit of an abbreviate. We'll cover certain things, but just to give okay. people a bit of a, a, a understanding of, you know, who you are and Sure. Yeah, you got here. Yeah, I mean, it, well, it, most people know me from diving. I was in the Olympics and all that. But and the next question is, how did you get into diving? So I started doing acrobatics and dance when I was a year and a half. I had my first performance on stage when I was three. I sang Dance With Me and did a tap number. And then um, I got a partner and uh, my partner went into gymnastics and I followed her into gymnastics. That was my first love. And, uh, and then, uh, we had a pool built in our backyard. And so I was trying some of my gymnastics stunts off the diving board at home. And my mom didn't want me to kill myself. So she got me lessons and that's how I got into diving. Wow. And then the rest is history. I mean, you the rest arguably is the most, yeah, the arguably the most successful diver in history. And you've gone on to do a lot of things, you know, following that. So it's a pretty incredible story. Uh, and amazing what you've achieved. So I think it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, I find it so fascinating talking to people like yourself. And I guess, you know, so much of that success, I presume, uh, comes down to mindset and focus. And oh, sure. you know, yeah. So was that, yeah. was that the case for you? You found it was really about being, you know, having that focus and discipline and, you know, ha having the right mindset to, to sort of uh, compete and achieve at that, at that level. Yeah. Well, um, you know, when I was, when I started school, I stuttered. So I was in speech therapy and then, um, you know, I, I was dyslexic. I didn't learn about dyslexia until I was in college. I was given just dys dyslexia as a vocabulary word in my freshman English class. And I looked it up and said, Oh no, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, all of the, the, you know, all of the labels that kids would call me, you know, oh, you know, you're stupid, you're retarded, you're a moron, you know, all of that stuff. And I believed it because I couldn't read like the other kids. So then, um, so I was in, you know, remedial reading and all that stuff, but, um, I didn't feel like I had my academics. 
So yeah. when I was performing on stage, uh, whether it was singing, dancing, doing acrobatics, uh, that was my area of success. I had success there. People applauded. I, you know, I got, um, you know, adulation and all that. And then moving into competition, you know, with gymnastics and, and then into diving, you know, getting some success there. And so that was <clears throat> really encompass really my, my self-esteem really, mm -hmm. you know, it was something that I could do. I could do it well. I could show people, I could dance, I could do acrobatics, I could dive. Um, and so that's the reason why it was so important to me. Um, but as far as, you know, you know, my development, I was, I, I learned how to visualize when I was three years old, because that was my first wow. performance on stage. And so what my, in, my teacher said, it was the day of the recital. I got uh, my costume, I got a top hat and cane, some of the choreography kind of adjusted. And she said, okay, do the routine fluid, put the music on and left the room. So I was three years old. And the way that I interpreted oh it is, okay, imagine myself doing the routine fluid. So it took, you know, four tries, three or four tries, and I got it fluid. And so then I went out of the studio. I found her in her office and said, okay, I made it fluid. She came back into the, the studio, increased the tempo so it was faster than what I would be performing. And she said, make it fluid. I said, okay. And so even at the faster tempo, I could make it fluid. She said, okay, you're ready. So then that was my introduction to visualization. Yeah. And so then by the time uh, late 70s, early 80s, the sports psychologist started coming around the pool and saying, have you tried mental imagery or visualization? I'm like, going, duh, doesn't everybody do that? You know, so um, so that's really been the key to, you know, a, a big key to my success. You know, and mindset is a part of that, too. You know, tapping into, you know, those resources because performance is in, is in your right brain. And music yeah. is right brain, color is right brain, all of that creative stuff. When you start judging yourself, you know, you have that that critic on your shoulder telling you how you can't do things and how you you know are supposed to do things, then that's left brain. So yeah. So that's that's the reason why I was able to be as successful as I was, because I was so right brain dominant. That, um, you know, I just tapped into that and, you know, the ability to perform. And that's how I viewed my diving. It, it, it wasn't mm. a competition to me. It was about a performance. So and for, to perform um, to the best of my ability at that moment in time. Wow. Well, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Like, I find that so fascinating. And I think visualization, I've heard, you know, quite a few people talk about it. I try and do it. And uh, it's you know, it's such a powerful thing, like you're saying, and being able to tap into that that thing where it's not about, um, you know, all of the external factors that we're exposed to in the world, which I think, like you're saying, anything creative, it's what needs to be done. I, I, I've, I, I would think in sport it would be even harder to tap into that because so much of it is about competing and measured on, you know, there's a, a winner and a, someone who comes second and third and so forth. Um, more so than other, you know, so it's so hard to like, you know, it would be difficult to stay in that mindset. Yeah, but, but the thing is, it, it's how you interpret, how you interpret yeah. information. So if, if the information that, that you are interpreting is that, oh my God, I have to win or, oh my God, I have to win, you know, get on the top of the podium, then, you know, that's a totally different mindset. You're, and you're also putting result before doing the work. Mm, so, mm. you know, the, the thing about it is, is recognizing that it's a journey to that, that, that place. Yeah. It's not, it, it's not, you know, um, you know, it, it's, it's not about the result. It's about the journey there. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and so that's where, you know, I mean, there are many competitions that I competed in that I learned more when I lost than yeah. I did when I was winning. You know, because yeah. it's like, okay, you know, I, <laughs> I missed my inward three and a half. I, when I go home, then I'll double up on doing those in a training session 
to make whatever dive it was as good as all the rest of the dives. Yeah. It's always, you know, it's always a learning process and taking that information um, and, and moving forward, being better than you were yesterday. Yeah. And, and so many of those things are just analogies for life, aren't they? It's like mm-hmm. we, and I talk about that in my, you know, public speaking a lot. It's sort of, we, we're taught a lot of the time to view things as we're either going to win or we're going to fail, you know, get the result we want or not get it. Whereas it should be framed as, you know, I've got this, I'm working towards this thing and I mean, it's either going to go how I plan or if it doesn't, that's almost, that's as beneficial because I'm going to learn from that. And yeah. if you, yeah, if you have that mindset, then you don't, and, there's not as much like anxiety about, you know, what's going to happen. You can look at life as a bit of an adventure rather than being this, you know, crippling, um, win at all costs sort of attitude. Right. And, and also too, I mean, yeah, embrace the suck. Okay. Yeah. If you're, if you're, if you're doing a new skill, if you're trying a new skill, then, you know, br- embrace the fact that you're going to suck at it for a while. And, yeah. you know, and, and because that's a part of the process, that's a part of, of the learning. That's, that's a part of the stuff because like, if you don't embrace the suck, then you say, oh no, it's too hard or no, I, you know, it, we, we use uh, perfectionism as an excuse for procrastination. I love that. That's a, that's a, can I, can I steal that line? Um, oh yeah. yeah I think that's, yeah. I mean, I, it's, it's that's not, a simple it's way to put it. I, like me. That. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I, use I, it. I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a number of people who have said that before me. So, you know, but just the way you put it there. Friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so true. But, um, and, in in everything, I mean, I, I was talking to my psychologist recently and I've like come over to New York and living off savings at the moment, building my stuff over here. And you know, it's, it's confronting and some days you just overwhelmed, but the, that's what my psychologist was saying to me, look at this as you, if, if you are struggling, see that as a positive because you're not going to realize it right now, but you're going to be growing. And, you know, if, even if things aren't going your way, you're growing in a different way than you think. And it's sort of when you look back on life is when you can see these lessons and see where it leads. But in the moment we can be so, you know, that perfectionism thing comes in again, where you're so wanting to control everything that you forget uh, about just enjoying the, and embracing that journey. Yeah. And also, uh, you know, which is, uh, you know, an issue I have with you know, so much of the social media is we're always yeah. making comparisons. We're making comparisons to somebody else's life. You know, we don't know what they've been through, what their history is, what got them to the place where they are at in whatever endeavor that they're, you know, that they're, you know, pursuing. Um, Absolutely. And, and so, you know, and you, it really is about embracing the struggles that, that you have along the way. And that goes, you know, it, it, it get it does get easier, you know, because when you, you know, when you learn from mistakes, then you know, the important thing is to learn from it. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to acknowledge it and, and embrace it and say, Oh, well, that didn't work so well. Let's try something else. And then, find out what works for you and, uh, and enjoy the process, you know, rather yeah. than, than so, you know, cause we get so, you know, narrowly focused, uh, on result, 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 result. Yeah. You know, yeah. but it takes a while to, to build those layers of knowledge and embody those, those layers of knowledge to, you know, to be able to accomplish some really incredible things, but we have to allow ourselves, give ourselves permission to fail, to struggle and, and, you know, move forward. And also, and I think this is really key in as far as mental health, you know, because I know that that's a real, uh, real focus of, of a lot of the work that you do. And that is ask for help. Absolutely. You know, I'm a firm believer. You don't achieve greatness on your own. You know, even yeah. you know, at the 88 Olympic games and I hit my head on the springboard and I came back, I couldn't have gotten through that competition without my coach, Ron O'Brien. And so there's always somebody there. So don't be afraid to ask for help. And also, you know, what I encourage people to think about when they're 
um, hesitant to, to ask for help is that think of the times that somebody asked you for help, that you had an expertise in something and somebody came to you. I mean, didn't that make you feel good? I mean, didn't you mm. feel appreciated? Didn't you feel valued, you know, in, in those moments? So when you ask for help, you're, you're, actually giving a gift to somebody else. You're allowing somebody to in, into your world, into your life, you know, in a very intimate way. Yeah. I think it's, it's such, and that's the thing, no matter who you are, no matter what you've achieved, no matter, you know, no one can do it by themselves. And, and, you know, and, and whether it is asking for help because, you know, look, I'm struggling, I'm, I'm not coping mentally, I need help. Or if it is, you know, in a work thing or whatever you're doing, I, I need support reaching out to people. People actually want to help people. And, mm -hmm. and, and on the other side of it, like you're saying, I, I often say to people, well, um, helping people, uh, it feels good when you go, go and do that. So even if you have a mindset where you look at it selfishly and think, you know what, I'm going to go and try and help in this area because it's going to make me feel good, but it's also going to have a byproduct of helping people. And then if we all have that mindset, we can, you know, change a lot of these societal sort of structures that are in place and make, you know, it just becomes more support out in the world, which is so important. Yeah. And, and the key is to, you know, to keep your sense of humor, laugh at yourself, you know, yeah. that, that's so, so important that, you know, you know, that we play through life, you know, yeah. Life is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be enjoyable and we should be playing through life. And I mean, shoot, I mean, I spent like yeah. the entire morning trying to get my Venmo thing working and it's, it's <laughs> like, oh my God, I'm such an idiot. You know, and then I'm calling this person, how do you do this? You know, and you know, it's, it's okay, you know, play through it, play through the struggles, play through, you know, the, you know, the challenges. Yeah, because we we do we take it so seriously, and we're you know we're being conditioned. It's probably worse than ever with, like you were saying before, social media and people. No matter even if even if you are happy with your own life, you can find ways to be unhappy with it because you go and open your phone, you see someone that's apparently you know we don't know, but they've curated it to make it look like at least that they're doing bigger and better things and happier and having more experiences. And then we tell ourselves, you know, what's wrong with us? How do I get that? And then you get anxious. So it's like just you know, realize that nothing's perfect, number one. And number two, just enjoy it. Like, I love what you said. I think if you if you always just have the mindset that I'm going to enjoy the process, then you can't really go too wrong, can you? No, no. And, and also, I mean, a lot of those pictures, I mean, that is just a snapshot of something. You don't know what's going on. Yeah. The 99% of the time that, you know, that they're not, they don't have a camera on, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And just, you know, you know, playing through life and, 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 in, you know, enjoying it, embrace the suck, know that, you, you yeah. know, and, and it's okay. It's okay to, you know, to, you know, it's okay to struggle. And, and also, I mean, a lot of those struggles, when you share your struggles, that's, that is vulnerability. You know, yes, yeah. showing your vulnerability and it's, you know, it, you know, it's so empowering for exactly. other people to see that it's like, oh my God, you know, they're not perfect and they have struggles. They have the same struggles I do, which gives other people courage to push through their struggles and their challenges. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just, I mean, cause everyone, everyone, you know, no matter who you are, we're human, we're going to feel good things, bad things. We're going to feel nothing sometimes, but it, it doesn't get talked about enough. And there's so much comfort in that. So it's, it, it's such an important point. Uh, yeah. And, and, yeah. The, you know, and, and the thing about, you know, cause like oftentimes, you know, you, you know, the Olympics are coming up right in Tokyo. And when you see the performances, you know, this, you know, this incredible excellence on display, hmm. you know, it's, you know, you're seeing a finished product. Hmm. You know, you're not seeing the struggle, you know, the injuries that happen during training, the uh, rehab, you know, after an injury, all of the, you know, the time and dedication and, you know, the, you know, all of the 32nd places, you know, that they've taken in their life, you know, to get to, you know, get up a little bit more and a little bit more, you know, to 15th and to eighth place and then the, to make it to the podium and, you know, top three, you know, it, it's all incremental learning and yeah. they go through that 
And then we see this final product, you know, at the Olympic Games and we think, oh, my God, you know, that yeah. this is this is amazing. But, you know, it's they don't see the struggle. And there's yeah. there, there's a huge, huge. It's like an iceberg. You know, what you're seeing is the t- tip of the iceberg and underneath the iceberg is all of the work that went on, you know, went to create that what you see. Exactly. And the work, you know, it's messy and it's not, it's not pretty, but it, <laughs> it, it's a game, like you said, no matter what you're doing, whether it's, you know, an Olympic athlete or working, you know, a nine to five job or running a business, the people that succeed are the ones that are able to find a way to enjoy that messiness and that challenge day to day with, without worrying about the end result, which, um, you know, I'm, I, that's what I was going to ask you before as well. I mean, you're one of, I, I, I don't know if you're the only um, diver or one of the few to win consecutive gold medals, 1984 and 88. Um, Pat, with- yeah, Pat, Pat McCormick. Pat McCormick won uh, two golds. Um, she won the double-double. Now that right. we have synchronized diving, though, it's it's changed. So they added four more events. So you have right, two right. more opportunities to you know to win. No, four more opportunities uh, to win medals. So um, yeah. So now it would be kind of comparing apples with oranges. It's a different thing, but yeah. I mean, in, in, like I guess the two parts of this question. Um, you know, number one, with what you're talking about before, with the visualization, you know, enjoying the process. If you didn't have that mindset and you had more of the mindset of, you know, your only thing was I'm not, I, I just have to win a gold medal. Otherwise, um, you know, you're looking for that to seek validation. Um, do you think you would have gotten to where you got to? And and can you also tell me, explain, you know, you're saying when you hit your head in 88, I'm just so interested to hear the psychology of, you know, what you went through in that process to come come through the other end. I, I mean, it's pretty, pretty fascinating. Yeah, I mean... It, it, <laughs> that's a lot to unload right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nick, that's a lot. That's Is that too much? Yeah. Happening. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, but, Maybe. Um, a, yeah. I might but, be asking it too, too, too big of a question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so like one thing that I, I always had performance goals, not result goals. And yeah. the reason for that was if I looked at somebody else as my competition, then I would be limiting what I would be able to do. Because if they, if we were in a competition and they missed a dive, more than likely I would miss the next dive. Right, right, right. Because I'm just looking at them, because I'm just looking to beat them. Yeah. So why would I limit what I potentially could do? And that's the reason why I had performance goals. Hmm. You know, the, you know, because then you have to, you know, to break world records, you have to be, have the courage to leave everybody behind, you know, because yeah. if you're breaking world records, nobody's, not, nobody's with you, you know, nobody, yeah. you, you know, there's not a whole lot of company there. No. You, know, so you have to have the courage to, you know, to go be beyond and, and as beyond as you can be. Yeah. Um, now, unpacking the the whole <laughs> hitting my head on the springboard, you know, when when I took off the board at my reverse two and a half pike, I knew I was going to be close. I stood it up a little straight. But when you do that and do that dive, you usually are afraid you're going to hit your hands or, or your arms. So when I came out, I made sure I was wide so I wouldn't hit the board. And... I started coming out of my dive and it was like, oh, okay. I didn't hit the board. And then all of a sudden I heard this big hollow thud and I go crashing in the water and I'm thinking, what the hell was that? And I realized, holy shit, it was my, it was my head. And the first emotion, the, the first emotion that I felt was I was embarrassed because here I am at the Olympics and I'm supposed to be a, be a pretty good diver. And I go and hit (laughs) my head on the board at the Olympic (laughs) Games. And so I was embarrassed. I was thinking, okay, how do I get out of the pool without anybody seeing me? You know, and there's cameras and the audience, you know, it's like, there was no way. And so then, um, so then I climbed out of the pool and, you know, and I was just, you know, because I was also HIV positive and 
you know, nobody knew about my HIV status except my coach. And so I was like covering my head and, you know, and, and, and making the decision, you know, to continue. My, my coach came to me, Ron O'Brien, he's, you know, he said, you know, you can walk away. You have all of these records. You don't have to get back up on the board. I'm going to support you a hundred percent. I'm behind you. Um, whatever you decide and kind of knee jerk reaction. I said, you know what? We've worked too long and hard to get here and I don't want to give up without a fight. And so I learned that, uh, after hitting my head, I, I, I dropped to fifth. So I still would have made finals, but I, you know, I needed to complete my last two dives in order mm. to you know, stay in, you know, in, in the finals. And so, um, what, uh, what Ron did after my, my head was sewn up and I said, come on, let's go for a walk. And what he did is he reminded me, cause I didn't have time to get over that. Yeah. In order to get over something, you need to process it. And yeah. I didn't have time to process it because I only had like 22, 23 minutes before I had to get back on the board. Wow. And so, um, first he reminded me that it was a total fluke that that ever happened and that to, you know, just to just disregard it like it never yeah. happened, you know, and he said, just do, do the rest of your dives like you've been doing in training. Nothing, yeah. nothing more, nothing less. Just do what you've been doing in training. And, uh, and then, and then, um, he said, you know, hockey players, they get 30 stitches on, you know, with, with cuts or whatever, and they get back on the ice. You got five stitches in your head. That's nothing. <laughs> yeah, and so we were like laughing, you know, yeah. and that's the key too. I mean, because that taps, you know, smiling, laughter, that taps into, you know, your body chemistry of, you know, endorphins and, and all to be able to, you know, assimilate and to, you know, push through, you know, a lot of the fears, you know, that we might have, you know, rather than the cortisol and, you know, anxiety and all that. So, um, yeah, so he got me laughing and, um, and that was key. And I remember, um, they announced I was, hit on a reverse two and a half pike. And then I had my reverse one and a half with three and a half twists and reverse three and a half as my final two dives. And so they announced the dive. I set the fulcrum and they announced my dive and I could hear an audible gasp from the audience because I was moving in the same direction. And so I took a deep breath and I patted my chest, like my heart was pounding outside my chest because of yeah. I felt like it was. And I took a deep breath in and I smiled and the people who saw that in the audience started laughing because it's like, oh my God, he's scared too. We're scared for him, you know? And, and so when I heard that laughter, I started, I, I started laughing, you know, to myself and thinking, oh my God, these people are like in my corner. They want to see me succeed. And, um, and I knew I was at the Olympic games and I couldn't hold back. So, you know, I did that next dive. And as it turns turns out, I mean, that was, I think the highest scoring dive for the Olympics. Wow. You know, so, um, yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it was pretty crazy. It was pretty crazy, but yeah, but I didn't have time to get over it. I, I know a lot of people said, well, how did you get over hitting your head? I said, I didn't have time to process it. I mean, I didn't even have time to process it during that games. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Is way too many other things going on in a short time time frame. You've just got to find that way to get yourself back up there. But yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. It's incredible. And I mean, I think that it's just such an amazing story and so many things people can learn um, from hearing that because it's, it's again, reinforcing the, the messages that you were saying before about, you know, not take, taking things too seriously going and just focusing on yourself and not worrying about what other people are doing and, and just going back to that process. You know, if, if you follow the process again, it gets you back to, to where you need to be. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty, I don't think many people would be able to sort of handle that kind of pressure and <laughs> do what you did. So it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and the thing is, I mean, it, that took practice. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, it was, it was all of those events leading up to that, you know, whether it was, yeah. you know, a world championships and, you know, things that I learned along the way, implementing a lot of those things through the process and then 
culminating in that, that one moment in time that putting all of those things that I learned together to be able to accomplish what I accomplished. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, um, yeah, it is an amazing story. And I mean, you've gone on to do so many incredible things as well. And I think it's just so incredible, you know, like you were mentioning before with HIV, with, with different causes you've stood behind and been an ambassador for and really spearheaded. You've uh, like, to me, you know, you, you've had so much uh, courage and belief in yourself and been, you know, such a leader in so many different ways, which I guess probably the same mindset you're talking about through your, um, your, your sporting career probably gave you that, that, you know, that ability to go and do what you've done outside of it, which I think is just as good of an achievement because it's, you know, you've paved the way for so many people. You've probably saved lives, helped so many people, which is incredible. Yeah, I mean, and in the, in the, that's one of the things because, um, uh, you know, I've, I've gone to, uh, you know, a lot of doctor's appointments with uh, newly diagnosed HIV seroconverted um, um, individuals and hel- helping them navigate through, you know, a lot of that. And it's interesting because, I mean, I, I have some friends who are HIV positive that, you know, initially when we were first diagnosed, I mean, they were so obsessed with their numbers. You know, mm. it's like, okay, my viral load is this, my T cell count is this. And, and they get, they even get depressed if their T cells go down and, you know, and it's, you know, and they'd ask me, you know, how, how do you handle it? How, how do you deal with that? I said, you know what, you know, I go into the doctor, he gives me my numbers and, you know, it gives me my progress, gives me uh, a plan of what I need to do, you know, to improve my situation or encourage me that I'm doing a good job, whatever. I take that information. And then when he puts that file back in the filing cabinet, that's where I put it. You know, I take my meds yeah. in the morning. Yeah. I take my meds in the morning. I take my meds in the evening, but I go about the business of living. My numbers are my numbers and they're just numbers. So yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't obsess over it. And also, I don't know. I don't really understand all of those numbers anyway. <laughs> so, you know, so, you know, I just, you know, focus on what's in front of me. You know, yeah. And, and yeah. that's so important. Thank you so much for supporting Move Your Mind. We're expanding the offerings of the organization and we're tailoring everything we do to suit you guys and to try and answer to all of your needs and the questions that you send in. The book is available globally. You can find all of the links at nickbrax.com slash book. And we've just released the Move Your Mind community. We've currently got a men's community group, a women's community group, a general group. We're going to be loading up other groups and you can find all of the links at moveyourmind.me. This group's been created based on the needs of what we've heard and learnt throughout running Move Your Mind. And we have live events, we've got courses, we've got huge amounts of value, the ability to share information, share ideas, work in groups together to, to grow and share your learnings, to learn about different topics. You get email reminders. There's a whole lot of features in there. We're constantly updating it. And we're so excited to share it with you. You can find all of the information about it at moveyourmind.me. Which again, you know, everything you're saying, these are analogies for life. You know, we we yeah. don't have to understand. We can't co- comprehend or understand everything that's going on in the world, but we can, and we can only control a certain percentage of what we do every day. So if we focus on that, and forget, leave the rest to, you know, if we're going to be sitting there worrying all day about all these other things that we can't control, that's there's like, it's got zero application to us, zero positive application for ourselves. So, uh, yeah, I think, yeah. It, it, it's like what Byron Katie, I, um, Byron Katie, who wrote, um, loving what is, you know, it's, it's like what she says in her book, there's three kinds of business. There's your business, my business and God's business. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's it. And most things are really none of your business. <laughs> exactly. 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 Most, yeah, the majority of things. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So it simplifies it. And, but, you know, I think it, it, it's just, and it, it's great how far the world's come with all these different areas because I think until people, you know, the main thing is just lack of education. It's the same with mental health. It's being more talked about now. Still got a long way to go. Uh, but 
whatever it is that someone's facing, you know, these are just things that happen to people. And it's about understanding that that's fine. That's normal. What do we do to deal with this? Mm -hmm. You know, with mental health, if you're going to, you know, if you need to seek help, if you need to deal with it, it's no different than I've broken my arm. I'm going to the doctor. I need to get it fixed. It's like, well, what's the difference? There's no, it shouldn't, there shouldn't even be like a 1%, you know, reaction to thinking that there's a problem with it. And it's sort of like the same with so many areas that we delve into, which again, it's, you know, so, so important that it's, it's talked about. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and it is, and, you know, like you said, I mean, if, if you have a fever, you know, you can't see it and, or, you know, and all that, but you know, it, you know, that it's there, then you, you go see the doctor, you know, and, yeah. uh, and, and also, you know, you know, with regard to, you know, you know, to mental health practices, you know, it's just like, you know, the, the biggest thing, uh, you know, and, and, and also, I mean, cause I suffered from, uh, chronic depression, you know, as wow. a teenager. And right. so I was, you know, off and on, you know, various medications and all that stuff. Um, yeah. antidepressants and all that. And also, you know, what's really important is knowing yourself, getting into your body, being aware of what's, you know, what you're feeling, you know, uh, diet, exercise, um, posture, posture. Yeah. We, we don't think of that. We don't talk about that, that, you know, in order to, you know, you can change your mood by changing your posture. Mm-hmm. You can change your mood by getting moving. You can change your mood by, you know, just, you know, being, being active and in, engaging. Um, and so, you know, that's really important. I mean, I, I've gone on to, um, you know, to go more a holistic approach. So, you know, I have a, a vitamin regimen. Um, and so, because my body responds better to that, and this is just me, but, um, you know, and, and also too, I mean, I, it was interesting because I, last year, right before the, uh, the quarantine and all, all this stuff hit, I went through a severe, severe depression. I mean, I was, right. in, but I recognized it and I knew there was something wrong. And then I saw this interview with Dr. Daniel Amons from Amon Clinics, and he talked about concussions and how they can be accumulative. And I was thinking, oh my God, I, I never got after treatment after you know, I hit my head on the board in 88, but I also had another, uh, concussion in 79 where I was out for 20 minutes. I hit my head on the platform in Tbilisi, oh, Russia wow. and out. And so I never had any follow up to that. So then I did a brain scan and it was injuries consistent with blunt force trauma and wow. affecting areas of, um, of the brain that, uh, you know, that operate, um, motivation and serotonin and dopamine and all that stuff. So then I got on a, a supplement regimen and also ox, oxygen, um, hy- hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Um, and so it's just like, it, it, it was transformational for me, you know, but, yeah. you know, but, but the important thing is to, to really be aware of your body and how is it, how is it responding? And also how are you feeding your body? You know, um, I've gone, uh, plant-based, you know, plant-based diet and, um, and feel so much better, so much better because I'm much more aware of, you know, things that come up and, and, and how I'm responding to, you know, various treatments or various activities. So yeah. it's important, yeah. you know, that, that we be all, our own <clears throat> advocates too, you know, that we learn yeah. to be our own advocates. Well, I think it's the most important thing because again, you know, we, we, it's such a complicated area. And of course we need, you know, reactive services. If someone's really suffering, they need to, you know, receive medical treatment. They need to receive, see a psychologist or whatever it is that we need. But to make a long term change, we need to educate each other and ourselves about what can I do daily? Uh, not, not reactively if I'm, you know, really struggling, but what can I just do to improve my quality of life, to improve myself, to improve my thinking and my well being and have daily things in place that, so that when something does, uh, go bad, I can draw back on that. And, and I think like you were saying, uh, from my experience as well and what I've learned, a lot of it comes from trial and error. There's no one size fits all. 
for me, exercise is, you know, yeah, exercise is by far, I've trained my whole life and that to me is profound in just how much um, benefit comes from that. No matter what's happening in the day, just any form of movement will just get your mind, you know, clear your mind. You can think creatively and it just gets you out of it. And But having those daily things and, and having them as a clutch that, you know, and I've had that happen so many times where you feel like you are spiraling or something's happened in your life and you're in, going through a bout where you're down and then you can just draw on these things that you know make you feel good and then talk about it and, and you know, ask ask for, for help. If we, don't, if we don't go and ask for help and we're not aware and we try and just push it aside, then we won't deal with the problem. Like what you were saying in that situation last year, if you didn't have that self-awareness and that knowledge that, okay, hang on, what's going on here? Why is this happening? Is there something different? Let, let's look into it. And you, you know, then you find, find a solution to it where you meet so many people. And again, it goes back to this, you know, capitalistic sort of mindset that we've been taught that no matter what you're feeling, you know, no matter how hard things are, just push, push forward at all. And I, I know so many people like that where you'll see that, okay, something's not right here. They don't seem to be too happy, but they, you can't get through to them because they're just like, no, I just got to push forward. And eventually, you know, that might work for a while, but eventually that's going to, you're going to crash. You're going to run out of steam. You're going to run yeah. out of steam. I mean, that's the whole, you know, motivation game. You know, mm. you can go to an inspirational talk and be, you know, high for the next, you know, two, three days, week maybe. But then, you know, when everything kind of calms down, it's like, ah, oh, you're just right back in the same rut, right? Yeah, so exactly. in, order, in, in order to create real change, you need to brace, you know, lifestyle changes. And also, you know, uh, it may even include changing your identity yeah. and, and, and how you identify yourself. I mean, we have no control over how others are going to identify us. They can give us all kinds of labels and all that. We don't have any control over that. But how do we see ourselves? That's what's important and that we don't take on what other people are putting on us and not not taking on, you know, unrealistic expectations for ourselves, you know, well, yeah. mom, dad, yeah. you know, I should be a doctor <laughs> you know? or dad said I should be an architect, you know, that we, that we truly live our own lives, that we, yeah. that we have to be in touch with who we are. Exactly. We, and yeah, we can't do that until we are in touch with who we are. And we're, we're taught the opposite. We're taught that, Okay, don't worry about doing any of that pers personal development crap. Go and, you know, go to school, get good grades, go to university, get a great job, you know, do all that stuff first. And yeah, then and this the will make you happy. <laughs> this will make, this you, will make happy. you happy. This will make you happy. You know, other people are telling you what's going to make you happy. You know, yeah, but yeah. ultimately, I mean, we we leave ourselves out of the equation. If we leave ourselves out of the equation, where's true happiness? It's crazy. And, and, and there's no blue, you know, you're not, again, you got to sort of discover this stuff for yourself, which is why I think it's so important. We, you know, have a conversation like the two of us are having right now. People need to hear this stuff because we're just simply not taught it enough. And it's not our parents fault, but a lot of the time parents, you know, they're doing it out of love, but they're, they're forcing kids to go against what they really want to do and go down a path that is not going to make them happy. And, and you, like, like you were saying just before, you really can't, work out for yourself who you are, what you ident your identity is, what you want to do with your life until you, you know, take a step back, peel back the layers and just go back to basics and think, hang on, what, you know, what makes me feel good? What do I really value? What, what gives me meaning? What's my purpose in life? What do I want my purpose to be in life? Mm -hmm. And once you have that, then whatever's happening externally, you can stay so grounded in it because you know that the external things that's going to come and go, you know, there might be some good times some bad times, but that's not what you're drawing your identity on. And then, then you can handle a lot of stuff. And also, I mean, when, when people talk about what is your purpose, you know, everybody's looking, oh, to save the world, to, you know, to make sure there's clean water. There's, I mean, and those are all wonderful, wonderful purposes if they truly are yours. But sometimes just living purposefully is good yeah. enough because being present, and being there for somebody, um, you know, just being present and picking up some trash on the side of the road, you know, all of those little things of, of expressing 
who we are as individuals and who we want to be and living purposefully in the present right here and now, what's in front of you, who's in front of you, are you talking to them, are you looking them in the eyes, are you connecting with them, you know, they're, rather than being on a phone and texting, it's like, you know, hearing (laughs) emails and text messages and Instagram and all that stuff, but being present, um, you know, and that's what I love about my dogs, I mean, my, my dogs are my, are really my joy, because you can't fake it with them, it's like, okay, if you're on your phone, okay, if you're going to ignore me, I'm going to ignore you, you know, and they go yeah, off to yeah. their own thing when you want them to be paying attention to you. So, but if you give them your hundred percent undivided attention, then they will give you their, you know, a hundred percent undivided attention. For sure. For sure. And just watching a dog, it, it does, it remind you that, you know, they, they're fully present all of the time and they don't they don't have any preconceived ideas about things. It's unconditional and they're just, they're just living moment to moment, which, you know, as kids, that's what we are like. And then it gets so conditioned out of us. So it's so hard to, to find that again, but it, it, it is like, like you said, so important. And, and it just, I don't, I don't think anyone could deny that it feels good when you, if you put your phone down and that's again, what I love about this podcast by, by nature of recording a podcast, it means you get to sit and just have a, one hour conversation with no distractions and, and you feel good after it. It's like, this feels great. You know, we don't do enough of that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's yeah. like, here we are, you and I exchanging and, you know, uh, you know, obviously inviting other people to, to watch, but just being present with each other, listening to each other, responding to each other and having that, that connection. And it's, it's so incredibly valuable. Absolutely. No, so valuable. And, you know, we've covered so many topics here. So we've got sort of a couple of final questions we finish up with. But before that, I just had a couple of other things I wanted to to ask you. And one of them uh, is in elite sport. Um, is it, what's your view on, I mean, you see a lot of athletes that go have huge mental health issues after they finish their career. And I guess that comes back to a lot of the points we covered before where I guess for a lot of people, it is you know, winning that gold medal is your, that's the whole lifelong ambition. Your whole identity is built on that. You win it. It feels good. And then it all, and then it's like, okay, who am I? What do I do next? And it's a hard thing for people outside to understand, I think, because they look and think, oh, but you've, you know, how could you be unhappy after doing that? But it's more complicated. But have you, have you seen that in sports be a problem and how athletes sort of deal with life after? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we've had so many suicides of um olympians you know that's yeah. that's been a huge huge issue because if you think about it I, you know so many you know elite sports athletes i mean that's how that's who they are you know yeah. that's their identity and so that's how they even recognize themselves even when they look in the mirror that's 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 what they see and so when you retire then it's almost like a death, hmm. you know, it's, and, and you have to go through the process of mourning, you know, and whether you're successful or not. And, um, yeah. sometimes when you are successful, it makes it that much more challenging because everybody says, well, you won, you won, you should be happy, you know, yeah. but you're losing a part of who you have been. So it's that reinvention. You yeah, know, of, of yourself, and also a part of that is embracing the suck because the next thing you do, you're not going to come out at this high level. You're not going to be coming out in a new endeavor as an Olympic gold medalist. You're going to come out, you know, kind of down low to learn and go through that process all over again. But the thing about with an elite an elite athlete is they know if they go back to where they started from and they remember where they started from, how, how they learned incrementally, you know, that, that knowledge itself can speed up the process. Yeah. Yeah. They can climb that ladder so much faster if they implement those, um, you know, those things that they've learned on the way up to the top of whatever sport that they were. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because I guess it can go one of two ways. It can sort of implode if you don't put that into place and don't have that understanding. Or if you do work through it, you've already got that mindset and that psychology and that discipline in place where you can apply that to other other fields and and work your way up and, and have success. So it's, uh, I guess, something that we just, again, need more education and support for, for athletes today, as we do in, you know, many other areas. Um, yeah. And, and oftentimes too, I mean, when you are, you've had tremendous success in, in a sport and people identify you as, uh, you know, Olympic gold medalist or world record holder or what, you know, whatever that is, um, you know, it's, um, oh God, is it, you know, it, 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 it's like mastery, right? Okay. So yeah. mastery is never achieved. It's never achieved. It's an ongoing yeah. thing. Um, when you stop being a master is when you retire from your sport. You know, it's yeah. like, um, you know, there's a story of, uh, you know, of this, um, you know, black belt, uh, master and, um, he aged out and then, and then he, he passed. But before he passed, he asked to be buried in, in his white belt the beginner's belt because right. he was no longer a master. He was a beginner. You know, and I think that that is something that um, we need to allow elite athletes to be beginners. Yeah. You know, to give them permission to be a beginner again. Yeah. Um, because there's so many high expectations of, you know, okay, they go, um, you know, on, on the world stage in the Olympics, you know, they achieved these things and then now they're pursuing a career in music or they're pursuing a career as an actor, or they're pursuing business or whatever, you know, they're not going to be at that high level because they have, they need to go through the incremental learning to get to that place. And yeah. so first time out, you know, uh, you know, I, I think the important thing is to allow those individuals to make mistakes and to, you know, and, and to, you know, reinvent themselves, you know, yeah. because it takes time to reinvent yourself. Yeah, oh, it does. And, and, and like you said, I think that applies just in life, that whole analogy of I, you know, you're by a certain age, you've got to reach X or once you acquire whatever it is, then you've got permission to relax. It's like, well, it doesn't really work like that. We, we never master life. We always keep learning. If you're, pursuing acting or something like that um you're you can can't master it you're going to be learning until you either stop or until you die uh and that there's not an end point but that, then there's like a lot of um comfort in that because then you can take the pressure off and think well it's okay i've got one goal here i just want to improve and get good at doing this thing but i'm never gonna have all the answers or master it and you know i'm just gonna keep learning and that's it takes that pressure off which uh i think society puts if we let society put it on us that can just detract us from going and doing so many of the things that we deep down you know want to do and having that peace of mind while we do it yeah definitely yeah definitely yeah My name is Nick Brax and I'm a storyteller who has dedicated my entire adult life to creating positive conversations around mental health. In recent years, discussions around mental health have become less taboo and entered the mainstream vernacular. I've delivered over 1,000 mental health seminars around the globe, including several TED Talks, and I believe we all have a story to tell. In my book, Move Your Mind, I cover my story and stories from people that inspire me, as well as insights from world-leading mental health experts. This book will help you to learn how to recognize mental health issues before they become a problem. Use your personal challenges as motivators, take ownership of your well-being, and create new daily habits that increase happiness and reduce stress. Um, so before I go into these final questions, just one last thing. You talked a little bit about it before. Uh, do you have uh, daily things that you do I mean, you, you said with, you've got a holistic, you've got, you, um, you diet, different things like that. Mm -hmm. Are there, are there certain things you do most days that help you, you know, that are good for your mental well being? Um, probably, well, um, and it was funny cause like you talked about your visualization that you need some work on that. 
I have a course for you. <laughs> I, I'd love yeah, to do this. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's meditation in motion. And um, basically it gives all of the elements um, of, of meditation, breaking it down into small enough chunks where you, you know, we focus on breath, keep being curious about your breath and breathing exercises, getting into your, into your body, bringing awareness in, into your body and how it's, you know, how it's feeling and uh, what's going on uh, and then activating the imagination with, and it's all with games, you know, so it's all fun. I mean, it's, yeah. um, you know, I, I think that that that's really important. And actually I think there it, it's great for kids. I, I do some of the exercises with kids and they love it. They love it. They, they have so much fun doing, you know, doing a lot of that stuff. So, um, yeah, so it's very accessible. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that is, is something that's, that is really important. You know, I do have a meditation practice, but also, um, my yoga practice is really, and yoga is meditation in motion. So, yeah moving meditation yeah yeah so it's moving meditation yeah. and so i have my yoga practice that that i do um and you know and and the dogs i mean the dogs keep me keep me grounded they keep, keep me <laughs> humble you know and uh you know and, and 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 that's that's something you know that's that's so important you know that you know being humble, that humility that, you know, we're always learning that, you know, because if, if you think you know it all, you know, you can't, you know, you, you can't pour into a full cup, right? Yeah. It's going to overflow. So um, you have to empty yourself, you know, each day, you know, and I think that that's really important that you start each day. It's like, okay, you know, I've, I've got, a, I've got all these wonderful experiences, but Today, I'm, I'm learning, you know, te you know, give, give, you know, teach me what, what I need to learn today. So I yeah. think that's yeah. important, an, an important practice. I really love that. And I'll have to, after this, get some information about the, the program as well, because it sounds, I'd, I'd love to look into that. It sounds really good. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so I much for I sharing, think, sharing yeah. those. <laughs> <I think that's, laughs> yeah. 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 No, but I appreciate you sharing it. Um, so we finish each episode with these closing questions. These can be, you know, quick answers, whatever comes to mind. It's just sort of five questions we like to ask each guest. Um, okay. So the first one is uh, what is the best childhood memory that comes to mind? Um, best childhood memory that comes to mind. Uh, best childhood memory. You know, this is a weird one. Um, <laughs> I, you know, because like I, I, you know, I'm, I'm an alcoholic addict and I self-identified. Um, and, but a memory was, uh, that just popped into my head was sitting on my grandfather's lap and drinking the foam of his beer. Wow. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, just, I yeah. just remember, you know, being on the front That's porch in the rocking chair with my, my grandfather sitting in his lap and he's giving me like the of, his, of his beer. I think I was probably two or three years old. <laughs> no wonder I'm I an alcoholic, that. right? <laughs> <laughs> See what he started? Uh, I know. Started at three years old. So three, yeah. three, you, you started performing and started drinking, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Oh, figure. Yeah. So that was sort of another, another thing you've, you've had to sort of deal with through your whole journey with, you know, drinking and, and that, that as well. Yeah. 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 And, well, and also, uh, which is I a, mean, it, that, that's an interesting, um, interesting thing that, you know, that I found cause I, uh, it's basically 13 years, you know, sober. So, but, um, oh, congr congratulate. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah thank you. And, and it's also like, cause like I've got friends who, you know, are posting their anniversary and all that stuff. And it's like, you know, a part of that too, for me has been how I, how I identify myself. And it's like, I don't really identify myself as an alcoholic addict. I, I more, I, I more identify myself as a person making healthy choices. Yeah. Know? And, 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 and understanding that. You know, because like um, a great exercise is, okay, if, if you do X, what is it going to feel like in 20 minutes? 
So like if you have this bag of Doritos or if you have you know, a quart of yeah. vodka or vodka or whatever it is, what, what is it going to be if you, if you finish that? How are you going to feel in 20 minutes after that? And, you know, yeah. it's usually like, you know, and, and that's the one thing that I love about being sober is like, I get up in the morning. I love the morning. You know, I see yeah. the sunrise and there's so, you know, it's so quiet and peaceful and, um, you know, to get up and not have a hangover and not be, you know, have a cloudy mind and all that and have a clear head, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's so wonderful to have those feelings and sensations. You know, far absolutely. Than the possibility of even, you know, thinking about that other stuff. But those exactly. thoughts come up. You know, those yeah. those things come up. You know, but just be prepared to, you know, how are you how are you going to deal with you know with the temptation if you're feeling tempted by it? You know, how do you how are you, how are you going to? What are the tools that are you, you're going to use to not go down that route? Absolutely. And, you know, I, the same thing. I, I had problems with alcohol abuse. And if I think back on it now, and I, I still will drink occasionally, but not, um, not binge drinking, but, you know, it's just that the feeling of like, not even the day after of how bad you feel, but I, it bleeds into, you know, that the next week. And it's sort of, it's this constant cycle where you just can't get out of it. You can't get that clarity. And then you sort of keep, you know, going through that same process where it's just, it's, it's never ending and it just feels so good to be clear and healthy. But, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. But, I, and I think that bleeds into, you know, addiction on any level. We're not, again, that's not, I think people think, oh, alcohol, drugs, that's what addiction is. Addiction can be eating the Doritos all the time. Addiction can be yeah. sport, work. It can, we can be addicted to sex. We can be addicted to anything really, any compulsive behavior where we're using that to stop ourselves from, thinking and feeling and, you know, being with ourselves. So it's anyway, that's, I'm going on tangents here. <laughs> I mean, the, yeah, no, it, it's, it's, a, yeah. it's any self-soothing behavior. Yeah. yeah and self-soothing yeah. behavior could be validation through sex. Self-soothing behavior can be getting, you know, immersed in streaming, you know, whatever series on Netflix. It yep. can be food. It can be any number of things that are, pulling it, pulling you, uh, keeping you distracted from some uneasy feeling that might be happening within, within yourself exactly. and not addressing it. Because it's, it's, it's not, and that's what people need to understand as well. I think it's uncomfortable and it takes a long time and it's, you know, not pretty to sit still and have to face those things. And there's no end to that as well. You got to, it's a constant battle, but it's totally worth doing. And I think it, mm. it's the same analogy as saying, well, I want to, you know, I'm overweight. I want to lose weight. Well, we know then what we need to do. You know, we're going to diet, we're going to exercise. And once we lose the weight, we're not going to just stop what got us there. We've got to keep going. And it might not be pleasant all the time, but the end result's worth it. And that's the same with all of this stuff. You know, it's like, it's a constant thing. Yeah. And, and, and there again, I mean, it's how, how you identify yourself, you know, like, um, you know, I, if you're trying to lose weight, then, you know, you hang out with people who have, you know, who are at a weight that you want, you know, that, yes. they're, fit, that they're, you know, it's, it's who you hang out with and, and then cue off them. And then yeah. you can, you know, you can build your confidence through their confidence. And then, and then it's, it's almost like eventually you self identify differently. Yes. Yeah. I think and it's so you, important self-identify as somebody who is making healthy choices, who is eating healthier, who is, you know, getting out and moving, whether it's hiking, walking, walking the dogs, you know, running, biking, you know, just getting active. Yep. Yeah. I think that's, um, you know, even if we have the best intentions and we want to do the right things for ourselves, if we're around the wrong people in the wrong environments, that are conducive to negative behavior, it, even the strongest willed person can get pulled back into that. So it's, it is, it's like identifying, okay, you know what, I'm going to have to remove myself from certain situations. I'm going to have to remove myself from certain relationships if they're not conducive to the path that I want to go on now. And because mm -hmm. everyone's on a different path, but I think it, it's such an important thing and you see it all the time. And I'm still, you know, dealing with that myself of constantly navigating, okay, how do I, 
stay friends with this person, but not be part of, not be drawn into that behavior. And, you know, it's a, it, it takes, takes work, but it's important. Yeah. And, and also, you know, to have the courage to stand up for yourself, you know, yeah. because I, I mean, cause I'm, I'm sure cause going to like dinners and events and that sort of thing and hanging out, um, I generally leave early, you know, because yeah. If you stay stay late, then you know there's more alcohol. You, you know there's less inhibitions and all that, and that becomes a trigger for me. So yes. then I know it's just like okay, you know what? Love you guys. I'll see you. You know, yeah. and yeah. and I'll leave. But to have that that courage to say okay, you know, enough is enough. I I know what my limitations are, and for me to have the success and and um you know, courage in myself, I need to be brave and step away and get out of Yeah, exactly. And, and, and the reality is, you know, if, if you're out with people and they're having a big night, they're not going to remember you leaving the next day anyway. So then you can just like have a coffee with them the, ne- <laughs> yeah. the next day or <laughs> whatever it is. So. Yeah. You'll see the pictures the next day of them dancing <laughs> on the tables and, you know, all the craziness, somebody, you know, passing out in the corner and all that. So like, oh yeah, that's what I missed. Oh, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> All right. Anyway, I've gone on a tangent in these final questions. So four, four more we've got here. Um, what do you think is? And I know there's a lot of burdens, but sort of, what do you think is the main, but one of one of the main burdens on mental health in society today? I think the main burden is um, uh, the main burden. Um, you know, I think I think the thing that, that that people have the most difficulty with is asking for help. Yeah, you know, is I mean, it's so hard to you know for a lot of people because then you know because it really is one of those spirals that can you know it's hard to get off of because when you get start going in that spiral, it's like oh I'm I'm worthless. Nobody would want to take the time. Oh, it's you know you you get into this cycle when you really need to be reaching out it's it makes it so hard um you know and uh you know and because i think you know i i know i was stigmatized you know by the whole you know that whole thing oh well you we don't need to lock you up in a crazy house you know or you know it it there's Hmm. uh I, I think it's shifting. I think it's, you know, mental health is, is making a shift. There's more people talking about it and being open and honest about it. And, um, I think it's, it's, you know, bringing down the stigma, but it, it's, I think it's always going to be difficult to ask for help. Yeah. You know, because yeah. once you get on that, that, that cycle, that merry-go-round, it's, it's kind of hard to get off. You know, it's, it's hard to yeah. find or navigate your, your way to, to really ask for help. Yeah. Yeah. That, that I, I, totally. And, and, you know, no matter how much, which is great that it's getting more talked about, but I don't think we're ever, we're not in, not in, you know, the short term, we're not going to get to a point where, uh, everyone's, you know, it's going to take a long time to get to that point where everyone feels comfortable to talk about it. And, and that, that's it. That's the thing. You know, the, there's one thing you should not do and that's do nothing, you know, go and talk to someone, right. go and go and do, do something about it because it will, it'll bleed into a bigger problem. And I think people often also don't ask for help. You know, there's obviously multiple reasons. Maybe they're, they're too scared or the stigma, but also a lot of people don't ask for help because subconsciously they don't want to have to deal with all of the internal problems they're facing because that's scary. So they'll, mm-hmm tell themselves there's other reasons that they're not seeking help, but really they're not wanting to have to confront because they know that's going to open this Pandora's box that's going to take a long time to deal with. So we try and avoid that and, you know, bury our head under the sand, which it's, again, it's not sustainable, but yeah. yeah. And, you know, and the other thing, cause I, you know, I was doing some shadow work with, you know, with a friend of mine and um, it was so fascinating because, um, you know, in, in, in doing shadow work, you know, you know, you know, you don't want to go there. You don't, you know, it's terrifying. It's scary, you know, but when I started writing, you know, I realized, oh my God, my shadow has, has a real sense of humor. It's sick sense of humor, but it's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty funny, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so once you get, get to a place where, you know, it's, it, it's not as threatening, you know, yeah. it's, it's yeah. not as 
scary. And so when I saw the humor in my in my shadow, I realized, you know, because like there's, you know, there's, you know, different shades of the shadow. You know? yeah. And the shadow, the shadow can be really, really super creative. Yeah. You know? Where yeah. a lot of creation happens is yeah. through the shadows, you know, because look at some, some amazing, amazing performances. You know, they come from a very emotional place. Exactly. That's where, yeah, a lot of the most beautiful performances come from this very dark place. Mm-hmm. We've got to be able to go there to, to find that. Um, yeah. Where do you see in, in the next decade, do you see mental health in society improving? In um, the next day, I don't know where, I, 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 yeah. I don't know how it's going to happen, you know, and what it's going to look like. But yes, I see mental health very much improving in the next decade, you know, because I think there's more people like you, Nick, and and others that are out there that are are, are, are talking about this and also talking about it in in a non-sensationalized way, non-threatening, yeah. non-sensationalized, not, you know, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's not this, you know, heavy, heavy drama, you know, yeah. it's this, you know, it's what it, what it is, what it was and basically how we got through. Right. Exactly. Exactly. It's just a normal thing, you know, another part of life that we all deal with and we've got to help each other get through it. Yeah. All right, I've got two more questions here. Um, what would you say is your personal definition of happiness? My personal definition of happiness. Um, um, my personal definition of happiness, you know, joy, laughter, love. Simple things, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right, and final one, um, there's definitely – so many of these that you've done, but um, what's one of the most, or I've got here the most courageous thing you've ever done. Again, you've done so many, but yeah, what would you say? <laughs> <laughs> we covered we covered so many of them in this. Yeah, um, we, but, yeah. Um, you know what? I, I I have to say writing my book, uh, Breaking the Surface, back in, what, 94? It was published in 95 um, because at the time I thought, my thinking was I'm sharing my weaknesses with the world and everybody's yeah. going to see how flawed I am that I suffer from depression. I was, you know, drinking, um, you know, al- alcohol and drug abuse in an abusive relationship, HIV positive. I was a gay man. I felt like I was sharing all of my weaknesses, but in reality, what I learned is by sharing my weaknesses, I was actually sharing my strengths. Yeah. You know, to, you know, cause when I was on book tour, people were coming to me and saying, you saved my life. Or I yeah. came out to my friends and family with about my HIV status through your book. So that was incredibly empowering and, and emotional, you know, because yeah. when it's, you know, it, it is like diving off a 10 meter platform. You know, you jump off and you don't know how you're going to land in the pool. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a powerful thing. And, and especially back then in 94, I mean, people are more open now about this stuff, but to have the courage at that point. And I mean, your story is insane. It's like such an amazing story. I just like to be able to share that. I think it's such a powerful thing. And I can only imagine, you know, how many lives were were saved and have been saved through all of the stuff you do. So it's, you know, so, so I feel, like I said, I feel privileged to have had you um, come on here. It's been so great to reconnect with you. I really, really appreciate it. Um, And just as a final thing, um, if people want to look you up or, um, you know, find out what you're doing at the moment or, you know, where, where can we, we'll put it in the show notes and we'll put links to it, but you know, where can they go to, to find out more about you? Um, well, you can follow me on Instagram at Greg Luganis, uh, yep. or Twitter. Um, you can go to my Facebook page, um, Greg Luganis athlete, um, yep. there and, uh, meditation in motion is on thinkific, M I M thinkific. Okay. So meditation in motion, thinkific. And we'll, we'll put the links for it. We'll have the links for people to, to go onto it. So yeah, but thank you again for coming and, and having a chat to me.
Nick, it's so great to see you after all these years. <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> well, you know, we'll have to get together soon. Absolutely. No, no, for sure. We'll have to, mate. Yeah. 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 Thank you again. I, I, love, I love the work that you're doing. Keep it up. You're awesome. So I re- really appreciate it. No, it mean, means a lot. So, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. But, yeah, thank you so much, mate. But um, we will. We'll have to. Are you, you're based in L.A.? Yeah, I'm in LA. Ah, um, I should have reached. I was actually there um, a week and a half ago. I should I should have ah. reached out, but I'll, I'll when I'm back, we'll have to try and try and catch up in person. Yeah, definitely, definitely. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd love that. Thank you so much to Greg Gaines for joining me today for the Move Your Mind. And just another reminder that the Move Your Mind book is now available globally. You can find all the links at nickbrax.com/book. And the Move Your Mind community is up and running. We have live events, guest speakers. We've got all of the Move Your Mind courses. We've got a community group. We've got a range of different groups you can join. You can chat. You can share information. We're getting amazing feedback, and I am rambling about it because I'm so excited. I really want to share this with you. I would love you to all check it out. You can find all of the links at moveyourmind.me.